Imagine that, you're pitching for a million dollars and the person you're pitching to wants a photo of your cameraman. <laughs> so if it That's wasn't cool. for that phone call with you, this whole company would not have started. And Nick and I walked back into Spotlock's office, walked straight into the CEO's office together and said, so, that time for me, arguably, changed my life. Yeah. And it cost him nothing. Cool. Today on the podcast, I am joined by Harry Hugo. Hello. Hey, mate. This is this is great. I'm I'm excited to be with you. Nice to have a conversation. Yeah. Proper first time that we've actually chat. Well, that leads nicely into the story that I'm going to tell you, which I'm very worried about. Which, you're, which you shouldn't be. So, a few years ago, I was managing a YouTuber called Boyce Avenue, and you won't remember this phone call, but I reached out to Goat to try and see if they could help with brand deals for mm -hmm. Boyce Avenue. And I caught, and I don't know how, but I got through to you. And you very kindly took your time and basically talked me through how brand deals worked. And the example you gave was like, if KSI came to me and said, I'm doing a poker night and you wanted it sponsored, we'd go to a, a you know, gambling company and we'd yep. get the night sponsored. And I was like, shit, well, I can call a brand and try and get, yeah, I was super naive and thought I could do that. And off the back of that phone call, Amy and I, my wife, started ringing brands, trying to connect them with influencers. And that's how outreach started. Wow. So if it that's wasn't cool. for that phone call with you, this whole company would not have started. Wow. I so feel, feel responsible. This very responsible <laughs> for, <laughs> for, the, for the mess that we're making now. So. No, you've done a great job. Um, you know, building a business is really hard. And I know we're going to talk about go and and kind yeah. of what what we've managed to do but i think shining a light on so many like talented young people yeah. in in this space is is great and and the fact that you've now got nearly 20 people in a business like yeah. very few people will ever achieve that yeah. um and you've done an amazing job and it's it. such a, a pleasure to be to be able to speak to you nice one mate i mean i've, I've always wanted to talk to you in depth about the industry and obviously both very busy um you've gone through a lot of life changes recently yeah recently got engaged yeah Congrats. recently got engaged yeah i'm trying to tick off <laughs> to tick off everything now um the dog the house the engagement yeah. um had your business sold acquired. the business <laughs> like just trying to tick everything off before between I'm 30. announcing the um the acquisition to getting engaged like we long? did the acquisition in March this year. So what day is it now? It's, Ju it's July. July. Um, so yeah, a couple of months, three or four months. Wow, not um, everything off. Yeah, just tick, tick, tick. Before I'm 30, just get it all done. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Um, so yeah, start, start with this, Harry. Tell me how the idea or the concept for GOAT first came about. Because I've, I've never asked you this. I've never gone through it. And I'd love to know. And I'm fascinated how these ideas come about. Yeah, so it's, it's relatively long-winded. We, So I started a business called Fresh Press in 2012. Um, and that was all about football blogging. I, I was yeah. a, a massive football fan. I wanted to be a sports journalist. I, um, age 16, I went to the local newspaper, which is the Bournemouth Echo, and said, okay, I'd love to shadow your sports editor when he goes to Bournemouth. At this time, they're like League One, League Two. I'd love to just see what it's like on a match day, to, whether or not this is a job I want to do. Yeah. They said, no, because you're not 18. I was like, well, fuck you, really. Like, that's not really how the world works. If yeah. I'm good enough, I'm, I'm old enough. Yeah. Um, so that night I, I set up this, this website um, for Liverpool fans. And within like three months, it was like the biggest Liverpool website in the world. Um, and the idea, the premise on that was, I saw the opportunity having worked, having been a f Liverpool fan on Twitter where there was loads of different influential people on Twitter mm. who were nobodies. They were just like me in my bedroom and they all had like between five and 25,000 followers mm. and they only talked about Liverpool Football Club, the players and the matches and things like that, transfers. But they were never, they weren't contributing to anything. Like they weren't, they weren't Guardian journalists. They weren't doing anything. They yeah. were just putting their opinions out on Twitter. So I was like, okay, well, what if I just got all of those guys as writers and just when they wanted to have an opinion, they wrote on my website and then they drove traffic to the website via their social media handles. Yeah. And that's how we drove traffic. And we like exploded mm. onto the scene. So off the back of that, I, I started other different websites, Arsenal, uh, Arsenal, Manchester United, 
and ended up getting 60 websites. And then off the back of that, I started looking for sponsorship. At this stage, I'm like 16, 17. I'm doing, I'm at six, I'm at sixth form. I'm like, my sociology teacher has allowed me to have my second laptop in class because I'm doing like, I'm coding websites on my right and fucking recording my lesson on a voice note uh, on my left <laughs> so I can read it and later on. Um, like so much crazy stuff. Yeah. And, um, and off the back of that, we're looking for sponsorship mm. just to try and keep the, like, the server costs are just going up. We're doing millions of hits a month. And um, we, we reached out to a company called Sport Lobster. Uh, they were an up and coming sports social network. There was like, it was, it, was, it was getting a tiny bit of traction, but it, we just saw it and thought, oh, they, they're gonna wanna get to sports fans. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sent an email off. Same day I speak to this guy called Aaron. Um, who was the co-founder there hmm. and we just like got on yeah. um, and he ended up sponsoring the podcast that we had hmm. a bit on the website for like such small amount of money because I just needed the money. Yeah. So I was just like, my mum was still delivering me cups of tea <laughs> when I was recording podcasts in my bedroom and we had the most listened to podcast in the world. Like in my bedroom in, in Bournemouth in 2012, like, it was mad, yeah, yeah. 45, 50,000 listens a week. Really? In 2012, like it was bonkers. That's before even podcasts were like. It was me, Ricky Gervais, Stone Cold <laughs> Steve Austin, and the and the Guardian. That was it. Um, and we just thought, oh, that's that's wow. a cool opportunity. Yeah. Um, podcast, be able to talk about things. Again, same premise, just get people on who had followers and get them to send traffic. Yeah. So then I, I end up joining sport joining Sport Lobster when I'm 18. I pick up my A level results. Uh, and the same day I get on the train um, and, and go for my first day at Sport Lobster. Mm. There's five people in a room. We're trying to build this next billion dollar unicorn, um, trying to take on Facebook and Twitter yeah. uh, and build a sports social network. Um, we worked there for two years. We grew the business to 70 people. Um, we raised $25 million in, in funding. Um, I become he head of social. Um, Nick becomes head of marketing who joins on the same day as me. So like there's five of us. Nick and I joined on the same day, um, and, and 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 Aaron is is a co-founder. Um, the, the way we grew our business so quickly is because one day I went to Aaron, probably about a year in, and said, "Well, we're, we're sponsoring the NFL, we're sponsoring the NBA. We've got Cristiano Ronaldo as our headline ambassador. We're spending mm -hmm. so much money on all these different like marketing channels. Like, why don't we just give ten quid to my mate who's got hundred thousand Arsenal followers on his account? Yeah, who I know over." the last two years has been driving yeah. hundreds of thousands of clicks to yeah. my website. Like I know he can move people. Mm. Let's just pay him 10, 15 quid and, and see if we'll post about the app. Mm. He did. And um, he drove more downloads that day than Cristiano Ronaldo had done that day. Wow. And we're like, wow. Yeah, this is it. This is it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We think like instantly like huge amount of light bulbs are going on and we're mm. like, this is it. We're, we're gonna, we are actually going to build a bigger business on Facebook. That yeah. day in the office, we're like, if we could just find another thousand of these guys, yeah. this is it. We're going to sell for a billion dollars. This yeah. is going to be the best thing ever. The reality is um, not every influencer, not that we call them that then, um, not every person online has the same influence. Yeah. It doesn't matter if they've yeah. got the same amount of followers in the same vertical, they, ju they just don't. Mm. And there's this intangible, like, loyalty that they have with their followers or their relationship with their followers that makes them either influential or not. And mm. it's not due to numbers. And so we tried over the next three, four weeks, we tried another hundred people that looked like this guy. Yeah. And not all of them worked. So like some of them provided no value. They provided hardly any downloads. Some of them provided loads. Mm. And about 20, 25% of them provided value. And we're like, okay, well, now we just need to continue to scale it. So we went to an agency who claimed to be the only guys in the UK that were doing this. Mm. And we're like, okay, well, we'll pay you to scale what we're doing as our operation, because this is it. This is, this is the medium that we're gonna grow our business. Yeah. Um, and we, already we were generating tens of thousands of downloads doing this, it was mad. It's like huge change in how the business was gonna grow. Mm. Um, paid the agency, they did their work, and they generated like 5% of what they said they were gonna generate. And we're like, if those guys are saying they're the best, yeah, and like, we understand it better than them having done it for like two months, mm. 
maybe we've got something here. Maybe there's something bigger mm. than even what we think we're doing in this business. Yeah. And we probably sat on it for another th- three or four months. Um, it all, my, my sport loves the days, but like feel like I was there for 10 years, but I was only there for two years. And so like all these things must have happened like and so How old quickly. are you at this point? Like 19. It's mad. It's absolutely madness. Um, and, and we just said one day, Nick and I said, we should just do this. Yeah. We're really good at this. Mm. And it works. Like mm. everybody in marketing is looking for a performance channel that actually works. Yeah. Let's just let's just do this. We met with Aaron, who'd left the business three months prior. Um, he kind of jacked it all in when he went on his honeymoon um, and said he didn't really want to do it anymore. Investors were taking over. We'd raised so much capital. So he'd left the business. And we went for lunch with Aaron and we shook hands that lunchtime on this idea that we were going to build. And I, mean, I don't even know what we called it because it certainly wasn't influence yeah. marketing. Like, it was kind of like a like a network, like this online network. And was it fan called network. Goat from the beginning? Yeah, called Goat from the beginning. Wow. Um, and we shook hands in Coat Brasserie in <laughs> Kensington High Street. Uh, and Nick and I walked back into Sport Lobster office, walked straight into the CEO's office together, and said we quit. Um, and well, wow, how did he take that? Not well. <laughs> um, Is that business still going? No, it's not. No. Um, and Nick stayed for six weeks. I got put immediately on gardening leave mm. uh, and I just got to work. Like we didn't raise any capital. Like we'd, we'd gone through this, this um, huge fundraising business yeah. and it was just constant. Like you could never focus on the business. We were always focusing on what the next fundraise looked like. Yeah. So it was just impossible to do anything that was actually valuable. It was all about what would impress the next investor. Mm. And so we were like, we're not gonna do any of that. We're just going to build a business that actually makes money. For context, Sport Lobs have never made a penny. Not a penny. We hired 75 people. The burn rate was like 500, 600 grand a month. Um, we had 3 million users by the, by the time we, I left. And we never made a penny of revenue. So we're like, we're sick of this. Yeah. We want to make some money. Mm. And have a business that's actually a business. A business is something that trades one thing for another at profit. That's, that's a business. Yeah. So we were like, okay, we're just, gonna, we're just gonna find a client that's as similar to Sport Lobster as we possibly can, because mm. we know what works and what doesn't in this, in this football sport space. Yeah. And we found this like gambling game called Predict the Six, got in touch with the CEO. Um, and we said, we will guarantee you that our channel works. Mm. Pay us five grand and we will guarantee you 5,000 new downloads. Because we just knew it worked, yeah, right? Yeah. So we were so confident. And so the other premise of GOAT was that because this agency had let us down so badly, mm. we were like, okay, well, why don't we... And they weren't the ag- other ag- only agency to have let us down. PR agencies let us down. Like, everybody just said they could do all this stuff and then they never delivered it. Yeah. So we were like, okay, what if we're just the agency that does what we say we're going to do? <laughs> like, if we're not the best, it doesn't even seem to matter. No. It just seems to matter if you just do what you say. Yeah. Like, and no one else at that point was just going, we're just going to say what we can do and then we'll do it. Yeah. Like, that was not a thing in agencies. So we're like, okay, we're just going to do what we say we're going to do and deliver and guarantee it. Because then it's like, it's on us. Mm. And it should be. Every other form of what of the world is like you guarantee. It's like when you walk into Sainsbury's, you go into the baked beans aisle, you pick up a can of baked beans, yeah. you go home knowing there's fucking baked beans in yeah, there, yeah. and then you get home and you open it up and there's no baked beans in there. Yeah. It's like, what? <laughs> that's not how it works. That's not how, that's not how this service you operates. You certainly wouldn't go back and buy any more baked beans from that place. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so we're just, we're, we're, we're Heinz. We, we, like you walk <laughs> in, you fucking, you buy a, a, buy a can, you get home, you, pour it into the sauce when you got your beans. Like, yeah. you know, you, there's no point in any other walk of life when you, you go and buy something, you get home and it's not there. Yeah. And that's what agencies were like. You yeah. just, you, you bought something and then it just never happened. So we were like, okay, we'll just, we'll be the opposite. Yeah. Um, and we guaranteed this, this game downloads and we delivered it week on, week on, week on, week, made profit, hired our first person, made profit invested it back into the business and we and we grew a business quite quickly. Had a million quid in revenue the first year. Um, 
five million year two, like, and then we just like racing forward because the market had gone from being incredibly skeptical on influencer yeah. to being like super bullish yeah. in like three months. It changed from us going into every room and educating people going, this is what you should be what doing. What is this? So we started in 2015. Right. So I reckon we were educating people, like literally sitting them down going, you're not gonna believe the opportunity you've got right now yeah. to do this for probably two years. And then in 2017, 2018, it just went bananas. Yeah. And and everybody just turned and went, influencer is, is it. What is the What was the catalyst? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I think Snapchat was a big thing. Instagram stories. Yeah. Click through. Track, trackable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But weirdly, influencer marketing was more powerful when it wasn't. Right. Like when you were just putting up Snapchat stories without a link. Yeah. And moving people. Like we could move like 30,000, 40,000 downloads a day off one Snapchat story. Mm. Um, but it's it's the most powerful form of media. Yeah. And it's still incredibly underpriced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, you know, if I think about Mr. Beast, biggest YouTuber on the planet, 100 million views of video. Mm. You know, we're buying videos off him, sponsorships are like two and a half million, three million dollars. Mm. Hugely underpriced. Mm. The Super Bowl gets 100 million people watch it. Yeah. And they charge eight million dollars for 20 seconds. Yeah. And you're in between 30 other ads. Yeah, yeah. They're all competing and yeah. you've had to spend, I don't know, 5 million on the creative and the production in order to make that ad. And you also have no idea what the performance of that ad is because it's Absolutely not trackable. No any, no any, any TV ad or anything is not trackable. So whenever we're talking to brands who are- And it's the, dead. As yeah. soon as it's done, it's dead. Yeah. Mr. Beast's video lives forever. Yeah. Exactly. So like $3 million on that. Yeah, fucking hell. $3 million on a YouTuber. Yeah. Crazy, but in media value, the best three million dollars you can spend in the world right now. Yeah, still. So, you know, fast forward to where we are now mm. 400 people global, um, in like 34 different like people on the ground in 34 different markets. Um, well, why do you think that because I know the industry's gone crazy over the last five yeah. years, say, but why did go? What, what did GOAT do differently? We and, delivered. And That's it. Yeah. I honestly believe that that is the only thing that matters. Because when I, when I, you know, very first came across GOAT, one of the key things that really stood out to me was when you talked about vanity, vanity metrics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not looking at the following, like you were saying earlier. Yeah. Everyone, but, everyone got distracted by that yeah. at the start. When even when that 2018 switch, yeah. everyone was still focused on how many followers do they have? yeah. yeah. It doesn't, I'm guaranteeing you the, the bottom end. Who cares yeah. if he's got 10,000 followers yeah. or he's got 100 million followers? Like, yeah. Why do you care if I'm still going to get you 10,000 downloads? Why does it matter? Yeah. So for us, data was the big thing. Yeah. Um, we had the data and we tracked everything. We understood everything and we're nerds, right? We're, yeah, we're yeah. not marketing guys. Yeah. We are marketing guys by trade, but we're, we're nerds. Yeah. Like we, we care about data and we care about things happening and because we were brand side looking at the funnel mm. we care we brought that thinking in and then yeah. and then ultimately we delivered mate that that is the big thing so many agencies set up yeah say they can do something because they need the revenue mm. and then can't do it and then they never can't they never get that repeat business I, our ability to get repeat business is yeah. incredible i do i do feel like something you did that was incredibly clever as well and we were talking about it before we started recording was you did build a brand around yourselves the the daily but vlogs. not for the first Four years, you, you can find right. nothing about Go yeah. until 2019 when we start the vlog, nothing. Yeah. But how, what, how did it change when you did start that vlog, daily vlog? I think it was so, we'd built a business to 80 people, yeah. probably 12, 15 million quid in revenue with no PR, mm. no one posting about us. Literally there was nothing online about Go yeah. pre-2019 um, because just wasn't a focus for us. We were just like, okay, we'll just win the work. And then if we do a good job, we'll get, we'll get more work. Yeah. Um, and a PR is important. And we're not, we're not doing this for the ego. Like we just wanted to build a great business. Yeah. So the ego has never, or ego has never been a far, part of it. And, and so much so that until the acquisition, we never had titles. It's the three of us. We didn't, who cares? Like mm. we're running the business as a three, we're all directors, all co-founders. Like there's no CEO. Yeah. Um, we've all got our roles. Like we all know what we're good at. That changes in an acquisition just as part of it, but mm. 
before that it was it was always, always the same um when the vlog happened it was it was a it was a realization that all of the work we'd ever won or like 90% of the work we'd ever won were off the back of historic conversations with myself, Aaron or Nick. Mm. Someone had talked to us, heard the goat story, why we're better, either at a conference or a panel or in a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Like our focus in the first four years was meet everybody. So that, and, and it comes back to your story at the start. I'll give everyone time yeah. because who knows? Like when yeah. you're out trying to build an agency that's like generating revenue and needs referrals and all those sort of things, who knows what someone's going to say about you and yeah, in the industry. Yeah. We've always tried to be the good guys yeah. um, and give people time. And so there's a value in telling the goat story to every single person we meet yeah. because it will come back um, to, to hopefully help us. Um, and, and that benefited. And, you know, when we did the acquisition, we were 99% inbound sales. We have no sales team, like 400 person business, no sales team. So it's, it's full It's full inbound because yeah. we genuinely believe that we've done all the legwork and we continue to do legwork by telling the goat story. Yeah. So if you come back to that and go, okay, well, the only way that we win business is by telling the goat story. And the only way we win business is when me, Nick or Aaron tell the goat story. Yeah. Well, then there's only so many stages you can stand on a day. Mm. There's only so many things, any podcasts I can do a day. Yeah, yeah. Well, then what, what, if we, what if we just told the story every day? Yeah to an unlimited amount of people yeah. and grow a brand around us telling the story. And we have loads of, you know, Gary Vee was doing it. Yeah. Um, but he was doing it all about him. We, and, and I like Gary, Gary. I think he's, he's done an incredible job building a brand and mm. that business is incredible, mm. but it's him. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we wanted to build a brand around the business and about the story of GOAT and GOAT as an entity. Mm. And it was never about me or it was never about Aaron. Uh, or Nick, and how did you balance that? Because we've we've been making content recently, and it, I I sometimes find it a little bit difficult to to take a step back and make it not about you while being in it. Like, how did you make that differentiation between it not being about? Because you we folk look, we got incredibly lucky with Matt. Yeah. Um, and he kind of became the star of the show. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and if anybody's watched the vlog, then you'll see why the guy's incredibly talented. Mm. Um, plays this perfect character of I don't really know what I'm talking about but I know everything about what I'm talking about yeah. and he's got this inc unbelievable knack and it's like the best human trait which is make everybody around you immediately comfortable yeah like even if you're shoving a camera in their face like he's just got this unarming ability yeah. to disarm someone immediately and then to just be the nice like brilliant yeah so no one's bad on camera with Matt mm. like everyone goes oh I'm really bad on camera yeah but mm. not with him like you're really good yeah like, yeah if someone puts a, just a straight camera on people, people some people freeze. With mm. Matt behind it, for some reason, he can get the best out of them. But how do we balance it? Well, we made sure that we focused on the, the whole business. And therefore, if there was an intern in for the day, mm. there was someone doing a shoot and it had nothing to do with us, we'd just send the camera there. Yeah. Like, there was no difference between myself or the intern's first day. Mm. We wanted to track the truth yeah. of what it was like working at GOAT. And working in, in a cool, fast growing, winning agency yeah. in London. And the, the truth is we got approached by Channel 4 to do 24 hours in an agency because they'd done 24 hours in police custody, yeah. 24 hours in. Um, and that was a catalyst for us to do the vlog because we we're like, oh, Channel 4 want to do it on us yeah. and we'll have no creative control. Yeah. And Aaron and I are Marmite sort of characters anyway. Yeah. And so we're like, well, we could be, we could be played out in, in the totally wrong yeah. way here. What if we just did it? What if we just did 24 hours at GOAT every day? Um, how did that, how did COVID affect that? Like when you were all working remotely? Yeah, I mean, look, we, we did it for the first like four months. Yeah. Um, and then it just, the product wasn't good enough. Like mm -hmm. it wasn't entertaining enough. It was difficult to get Matt to people. Mm. Matt's talent is is when he's around people mm. and when you have banks of desks and you can just like jump over them and yeah. do crazy things and jump yeah. in ball pits and like disrupt yeah. the business like that's when we create the best content um but we just saw our whole office as like a s set yeah and people would walk in and go wow yeah, yeah. I, don't, I, I recognize this yeah. like, it was so powerful for us to walk into pitches and people know who we are 
Mm. And people want a photo with Matt. Yeah. Like, imagine that. You're pitching for a million dollars and the person you're pitching to wants a photo of your cameraman. <laughs> like, yeah. It was just it so powerful. It turns on powerful. its head, doesn't it? That conversation is... Exactly. We had all the power. Yeah, yeah. The leverage. Yeah, exactly. You've got all the leverage after that. But you, you mentioned the acquisition. Mm. It's a big, big moment, obviously, for you three as founders. Yeah, and, and a huge moment for the industry. I don't think that, that should yeah. be downplayed. Like, yeah. it, you know, we, we never planned to be the first to go, but mm. we are the first influencer business to have sold to a network. Mm. And that is a massive massive moment in the industry mm. um, because it means this serious yeah, yeah like this is this game is is big for people now so do you see more happening i think it's gonna be soon? massive in the next 18 months i think three or four or so really yeah all the ones that you know about i think they'll all sell in the next 18 months because How it's just not because they necessarily want to mm. because i think the deal will be too good right to turn down because i think all the networks will look and go wow wpp so WPP have now bought three hmm. and they've got Ogilvy yeah. who do it as well. So yeah. they've got Ogilvy, Social, they've got uh, obviously bigger in the States, they've hmm. got Village hmm. and then they've got us. So they've got four hmm. and the only other network that has any influencer business is Dentsu who bought Gleam yeah. in 2016. Yeah but there's a talent agency. So slightly, slightly different. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think the impact's going to be on the industry of those companies getting acquired and it effectively consolidating to the networks? Like what is the, the initial impact of I that? I think more budget moves. Like that, that's always the key. Well, the key driver in anybody trying to acquire something is to either take market share, mm. stop a competitor building, mm or where they think they can make more money. And if they think they can make more money in influencer than on TV mm. or on programmatic, then they'll pump money into influencer, but they needed to own the channel in order to do that. Yeah. So I think it's, you know, we, we've always talked about percentage, percentage budget and what we believe influencers should take of your budget. Mm. We think it should be probably about 20%. Like we're at point something. Yeah. So, TV is still like 50% of all these big, it's big wild, brands. And like when you're, when you're talking with, now we're in the WPP rooms, like we're talking about billions of dollars, billions going on TV. And we're like, wow, you get, you will give one, give us 1%, <laughs> yeah. like fuck 20%, yeah, we'll give one. us we'll 1%. One. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like this is, it's just a different level. Yeah. Like um, over the course of our eight years, we've we've had like these hallmark moments where, you know, we did our first five grand deal, first ten grand deal, yeah. first fifty grand, hundred grand, million, mm. ten million. But like, all of these are tiny, yeah. tiny, tiny deals. Like, we know of three or four pitches right now live that are a billion dollars each. I'm like, oh my god! Just give us a percentage. Yeah. 1% would be one of our biggest clients ever. But we believe that you should spend 15%, 20%. Mm. That's the truth. Like, I genuinely believe that if you're a forward thinking brand looking to transform in the next 10 years, yeah. you need to be spending 10, 10 to 20% on your influencer strategy mm. in 2023. So, what you said earlier, though, because it still happens, you got to spend it correctly with the right people who mm. actually deliver. Because I do think there's still a lot of people that don't deliver. I agree. And there's a, you also don't get fired as a CMO for spending money on TV. No. Um, because it's proven, safe. Yeah. Uh, you do get fired if you spend 20% of your budget on influencer and it doesn't deliver. So there's always that risk. But some, some people will take the risk. Which is actually fucking mental if you think about it. Because the only reason they're not getting fired is because they can't track the results. So they don't know. If yeah, it works or not. oh, it's all backward. Yeah, it's all backward. Aside from what the effect will be on the industry. Yep. How has it been for you, just mentally selling this this baby? I always call my business my baby. Like, yeah, yeah. This baby of yours to somebody else, and now you're not. You know, you don't have that hand. Of course, you're still hands on, but you you don't have that connection to it that you've always had for the last eight years. Um. The 
I suppose it's slightly easier because we did do the private equity deal two years ago. Yeah. Right. So we had we'd been through a transition phase with yeah. that, um, and we'd been through that process. So like, I wouldn't say we're numb to it. Yeah. But like we, it wasn't just like one moment where where it all changes. And I, and speaking candidly, right, the the WPP deal financially mm. wasn't as life changing as the private equity deal. Not because of the numbers, just, just because yeah. you go from naught to something is yeah. way bigger than going from something to something. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I get you. So mentally, you know, it's it's just a totally new challenge now. Yeah. We we have a challenge to integrate two businesses together. Mm. That's a massive challenge, something we've never done before, which is interesting. You know, two 200 person businesses going into one, Inca and, and Goat, and being rebranded as Goat, which is great for us. Yeah. Um, leading a business within a network of 120,000 employees in the FTSE 100. Tough, <laughs> interesting, yeah. new challenge, something we've, something we've never done before. Yeah. Um, and you know, we're, we're, we're entrepreneurs. We, we want, we want to learn things and do things and create change. And mm. there's no, there's no denying what, you know, that WPP, you know, liked us for being different. Yeah. Um, we aren't a wave maker. We aren't an Ogilvy. We aren't a mindshare, a media com. Mm. Like we are different and, and we will, we will, you know, be disruptive, um, and, and try and force some, force some change, uh, both inside the business in a good way. Yeah. Um, and, and also in the industry, mm. because I think with WPP's backing and Group M's backing, mm. you know, the media landscape can consi considerably change yeah. in favor for influencer in, yeah. a, in a very, very short amount of time. Taking it really, really far back to you growing up, you started a company when the, the first company you talked about, the sports company, 16, 15, 16? 16, yeah. So I usually ask people that come on the podcast if they've, if they've got a business, have they always been entrepreneurial? I'm guessing you've always wanted to run your own business, right? Yeah. <sighs> or was it just you were just like doing projects and you kind of fell into running businesses? Yeah, good question. So my dad's always, my, I grew up in pubs. Right. Um, and restaurants. So my dad has always run his okay. own business. Right, okay. My mum is opposite. She okay. couldn't think of anything worse. <laughs> What did she, what did she She do? now works for me, um, <laughs> but yeah. she couldn't think of anything worse than yeah. running her own business. And, and she loves the idea of clocking off at five o'clock mm. and not having to worry about work and enjoying her life. Yeah. And I admire people like that because yeah. I can't do that. Yeah. Um, my dad is far more wired like me. Um, he was relatively successful in the restaurant and pub industry as, as successful as you can be in, in industries like that, mm. probably in a very, very difficult time yeah. um, for, for pubs and restaurants. Um, when I, I, I had an obsession probably at the age of 13 with the bill and therefore I thought I wanted to be a detective. I'm relatively academic. So like I, I always thought I'd do something with like an academic mm. side. So like the, the detective where it's kind of like using logic and thinking about things and problem solving. I, I'm quite good at that. Mm. Whether or not I'd been a good detective or police officer, <laughs> I've got absolutely no idea. Probably not. Um, but that's what I thought I wanted to be right. from like 13 to 15. Mm. Then I really started to assess my options at 15 because I knew I, I was going to go to sixth form or college. Mm. Wasn't a massive fan of the idea of university. Just didn't want to keep prolonging my education. So I was like, okay, what can I do that I really enjoy and mm. can do it quick? Yeah. I'm very impatient. <laughs> And that's why like the, the police thing just came. As soon as someone told me you had to do two years on the on the streets. Yeah, you're like, I'm out. I'm like, yeah. No, no, no. I'll, I'll give me the DCI uh, yeah. title immediately <laughs> at age 18. Yeah. Um so then I started just I literally built like this matrix in my head about okay, what what do I love? Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, that old phrase that if you do something you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Yeah. What do I love? I love football. I absolutely love football. Totally obsessed with it. And I was like, okay, well, what, why do I actually like football? Okay, well, I like, I like watching football mm. and I like the idea of being friends and understanding football at a deep level. I want to be friends with players. I want to know managers. I want to, I want to be deeply yeah. entrenched in football. So I've you know, kind of built this matrix out. I was an all right footballer, but never, was never going to make it. Um, and like this matrix spits out 
sports journalist. Ticks mm. every box. I get to watch football for free. Yeah. I get deeply entrenched into the politics and the everything that comes with football. Yeah. I become friends with players, yeah. managers. Perfect. No. I'm academic enough to be able to write. I can do that. Perfect. That's the job. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. I'm going to do everything I can. And then it comes back to that Bournemouth Echo yeah. thing. And I'm, I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's like the first rebuttal. And then I thought, okay, well, I'll just do it myself. And then I ended up working for Liverpool Football Club when I was 17. Wrote for the Times Sports Desk when I was 17. All off the back of the websites I yeah. built. Um, because I carved my own path in that, in that world. And I'm incredibly proud of what that business managed to create, mm. the amount of young journalists. So the, the premise of Fresh Press was, it was all about getting young people right, who couldn't okay. get journalism jobs yeah, yeah. into journalism because they had a platform where millions of people could read their work, but they were 14. Mm. Yeah. But because they were good. Yeah. They were good enough. They were good enough, but yeah. nowhere on the page that say how old the person was that wrote no, it. God it's just no. about it was good. Yeah. Um, so the amount of people that have come out and, and, you know, at one point I had 500 writers writing for every day. Like it was massive. I had a bigger writing team than the Daily Mail at its peak, 2013. So the amount of like talent that has come out of that business mm. and is now writing for The Guardian, yeah, yeah, writing yeah. for The Times, yeah. head of media at football clubs, like all of them in their 20s yeah. because they had this incredible footing. And I don't, I don't take the credit for that. Like these guys, yeah. in the same way as I did age 16, just took it upon themselves going, actually, in my spare time, I'm going to hone a skill, yeah. a craft. And those are the people that we really got together. And ironically, eight people in our business came out of Fresh Press. The goat. Really? And some of the most senior people in our in our team yeah. were the most senior people at Fresh Press, but they right. were all teenagers at the time. Like Tom Bohr, Michael Oliver, Frankie Hobbs, our first employee, all of them ran football websites for me. Yeah. And I'd never met them, ever. I never met my business partner in Fresh Press until a year into the business, because we just did everything via Twitter. That is mental. Yeah, and this is before like video calls were a big thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We used to Skype, <laughs> yeah. but like voice. Yeah. Um, well, it goes quite nicely into one of your newest ventures now, which is owning football club. The football club, yeah. Talk oh. about that. That is... Best thing I've ever done. It's like the dream, right? You grow up as a kid, you go, oh, yeah, I, want to own, I want to own a football club. Yeah. And some part, sometimes it feels like the dream. Sometimes it feels like the biggest burden I've got. <laughs> um... It is, it's the most fulfilling and rewarding thing I've ever done. Wow. Um, it, it's my hometown club. Mm. I played for them as a kid. That's amazing. I went to school in the town. I don't live there anymore. Um, I don't live a million miles away. I live like 20, 30 minutes away from it. Mm. Um, but like, I see people I went to school with come to the games. Um, and that's weird. Yeah. But we've, the, the premise of, of the takeover or, you know, for, for for me, it's you know, it, it's about being involved in this club, and it's it's a community club. So like, there's yeah. no shares. Yeah. This is a this is a purely for community. Every single pound I put in, mm. I will never get back. It's literally I'm literally burning it. <laughs> um, but the feeling of physically people walking into the game because they want to be a part of something, yeah, is like nothing I've ever done before. Because I've only ever done digital things. Yeah. So like, yeah, you've seeing, never had that physical. Yeah, seeing yeah, like yeah. 150 people on your website on Google Analytics live mm. feels like a tiny number. We get 150 people to walk into the ground yeah. on a Saturday. Yeah. You're like, wow, it's quite, it's quite cool. Yeah. yeah people yeah. care. Yeah. And then, you know, you build it. So when we walked into that club, yeah, an average of 100 people went to the games. We're a year in. Um, we've done huge renovations to the ground. Wow, well, you know over a hundred thousand pounds invested into, into infrastructure. Mm. Um, built a new stand, we've built, you know, improved the pitch, mm. um, improved the food, the, the drink. We yeah. just try and make it a great place to be. And the, the premise was we want it to be the best match day experience in the UK at non-league level. But when you go, you spend three pound 50 on a pint because we want to make it the cheapest pint I in town. That, yeah. uh, you spend four quid on a quality burger from the butchers. Yeah. Um, you come in for eight quid and you can bring your son or daughter who's under 16 in for free. Yeah. So you can have a great time at the football locally. You might be able to walk there and you can spend less than 20 quid. Mm. And it's three hours of entertainment because you go before, you go for 90 minutes. It's amazing because it, football in general is very overpriced now, right? Ticket I don't think you can prices. go, unless you live close by, I don't think you can go to the football for less than 200 quid now. 
per person. It doesn't matter if that person's 14 or like, think of the travel. Yeah. Maybe you're having to get a hotel because you're going to Liverpool, Manchester United yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Um, you get a ticket, that's 60 to 100 quid yeah. if you're lucky. If you're lucky, yeah. Um, food is expensive mm. for football. Nine, 10, 12 quid. Yeah. Beer is six, seven quid. Yeah. It's 200 quid a person, I think. Let's say it's 150. Yeah. 300 pound for you and your 13 year old son to go and watch the football he watches on TV. 300 yeah. quid. But people can't afford to do that. No. Come to Farnham Town or non-league in general. So forget, forget Farnham. Go and support your local team who need the help yeah. um, for less than 20 quid and have a equally fun day out. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what, what's the what's the goal? Is the goal to get them? The goal is promoted? to have fun. No, to just to have fun. Yeah. Like as soon as it becomes serious, it becomes far less fun. Yeah. Um, and it and it's genuinely. I was saying this yesterday. Um, well, it was Tuesday evening. We had a game, and, and someone asked me that question, mm. and I said the the real goal, because that it's my hometown, mm. is to make and and the hometown is like a rugby town. Right, okay. Like it was Johnny Wilkinson's club. It was What's massive it? off the back of ah. massive off the back of two thousand two World Cup. Wow. Didn't so two thousand three World Cup, sorry. Um and and therefore like Farnham Rugby Club is the big pull. It's not massive, like it's like four hundred people a game. Yeah. Um but they've never had a football team they can be proud of. Yeah. So I'm like, what if we made Farnham into a football town? That would be cool. More people go to the football than the rugby. That was what I thought a year ago. Yeah, we yeah. are in that position right now. More yeah. people watch Farnham Town Football Club than watch Farnham Town Rugby Club a year after we, that we got involved purely because of marketing. Listen, well, as I was going to say, the, the social media side of it, I, you obviously are focusing on it. Really, yeah, I think really. that was a, was a bit like imposter syndrome for me. It was like, can I, can I, am I actually good at this? Like, <laughs> I've just built, am I, am I good at marketing? Or am I good at building a business? business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, So I, I thought, feel, yeah, okay, I well, let's take it right down to the grassroots. Yeah, yeah. Give me basically no money. Yeah. And go, can you actually turn the dial? Can you actually move it? Yeah. And we moved the dial from 100 people a game to 450. We got, in our cup final last game of the season, which we won, we had 1,200 people at the ground, record attendance. Mm. And we had 1,500 people watching live online wow. for a 10th tier football match no one should care about. No. And nearly 3,000 people watched us score the last minute winner to win the cup. Amazing moments. Moments that are just as good at the 10th tier of football as they are in the World Cup final. Because as a fan, they're exactly the same. Yeah. That moment when the ball hits the back of the net in the 124th minute in extra time is exactly the same feeling yeah. as it is in the World Cup final. I love it, mate. You can, you can feel the energy that you have for this. It's for this so podcast. rewarding, mate. Yeah. Honestly, like you see... Fat, you see kids walking in with the kit on. Yeah. And it's like, wow, this is, we're building something that people would never mm. think about. We're, again, 10th tier of English football, we sold 500 away kits last year. Away kits. That is mad. The combined number of kits sold in our league last season, mm. outside of us, was 25 kits. So what, what are you doing that's different to other non-league clubs then? We're just embracing change. We, we're doing... Focusing on digital, yeah. but also not, not forgetting where we come from and what normally is all about around community. So yeah. embracing schools, yeah. um, sports clubs, mm. giving away free tickets. Like so many football clubs are so hung up on charging the person to come through the gate because yeah. that's the money. Makes no difference. If we, if we charge zero pounds for everyone to come through the gate mm. or 10 pounds, we will make the same amount of revenue. Mm. It, it, the people just spend the money in the ground. Mm. Um, now, we obviously make less profit because walking in the gate is 100% profit, mm. but I want people to have a great time. Yeah. People don't just remember a game for the game, they remember the day. Yeah, yeah. They remember going with their mates. They remember having a good burger, like you said. They remember you know, having a cheap pint, yeah. Go, going to pay for a pint and going, three quid. are you sure? <laughs> yeah, like, Those are the yeah, things yeah. that people yeah, remember. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we, we brought in plastic cups with branding on it and the fixtures. So, because you can't have um, glass by the pitch, but you can have a drink by the pitch. You can bring your dog. Mm. But we, we brought in plastic glasses so that when you get a pint, you can take it out and then you take it home. 
Yeah. That's your glass. Bring it back if you want. That's that's a sustainable yeah. part of it. But really, I want you to have that glass oh, at yeah. home so with all the fixtures all, on yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I want you to come back. Yeah. So little marketing techniques that cost us no money because mm. we have to have a glass anyway. We have to give out a plastic glass. I think you're showing that you actually are pretty good at marketing then because it, you're, it's you're doing thinking about that's, things. That's not digital at all. No. And that, that was my test. Like, yeah. I can, and it wasn't just me. It's, it's, three other guys that also work at GOAT and my best mates mm. um, are, are just testing ourselves. Like, yeah. are we good at this? Or or are, have we got lucky? Or are we good at building a business? And actually, then we've got loads of talented marketers in the business. Mm. Um, but there is there is just so much interesting stuff you can do. And you can have a real impact at community level. Like, mm. with small amounts of money. You know, what I'm talking about is, is, is large in the grand scheme of things. And, and I understand that. But, you can have impact in community opportunities like football clubs, like rugby clubs, like tennis clubs, whatever it might be, by just giving people time yeah. and expertise. Yeah. Um, and that's the biggest thing, but it has to be fun. Yeah. And that's why that answer is always when people go, why are you doing this? And what's, what's, because it has to be fun yeah. because it's a hobby. And I don't do, I'm, I'm not going to do it anymore if it's yeah. a burden yeah. or, you know, sometimes it feels like that when you lose 4 0 and you've traveled <laughs> away and it's freezing cold and yeah, yeah. someone's shouting at you because yeah. you've not signed the right player. But like, it, how it, have you, yeah, how have you felt? Because it is non league, so I'm hoping you don't get too much shit from people. I did last year. How's that been? Because I you, got a lot from the away fan. Yeah. Um, it's fine. Like, I've had, I've had that all, all my life. Like, always want to be that person that people shoot at. Yeah. And I think we've, because we've done it the right way. Yeah. Like lots of people come into football and just throw money at players. Yeah, yeah. We've built infrastructure. We've built long-term benefit for the club and the community. Yeah. We've it, we've created a feeling within the town where people actually think three o'clock Saturday go to the football. Mm. Um, you know, we had five hundred people come to a friendly last week. Mm. It's like what? No one used to do that. It used to be like twenty people. Like, yeah. Like, um, it's, it's incredible, mate. What you're doing. I think that, like you were saying before we um, started recording, there are a lot of similarities between sport and business. Yeah. I've always thought so. I, I played rugby growing up. I think so much of what I learned playing rugby has gone into business. But I think that resilience element is the biggest thing. Resilience, teamwork. Yeah. Communication. Um, communication being about not, yeah, something said in the moment isn't, it, it, it isn't yeah. what it's all about. Leave it on the field. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's important. Um, Ging people up when they've made a mistake. Yeah. Getting around them. Never like smashing people when they made a mistake. It just isn't worth it. Why, yeah. why beat them? Beat them when they're winning. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's the best time. Yeah. You want to be shouting at people when they're winning. Mm. You know, that's, you don't want to get into the dressing room and just celebrate every time. You need to, if you've just won 6 0, you should be shouting at the guy for not passing the ball. Because mm. you always want better. Yeah. You always want to be better we should have won seven nil why'd you miss there like how yeah if you lose three nil there's, there's no point bashing it on people mm. because they know they know they've fucked up yeah same in work like if you know if someone knows they're fucked up they've fucked, fucked up mm. they've done a great job then it's about what could we've done what could we actually have done better mm. how could we have made more margin could we have made a better decision here did we do as good a job here what would we do next time that's the time to bash people because mm. people want to get better yeah um you know, at the same time, you go, you've done a great job, but yeah, same in football. Um, Do you think that sometimes, though, for certain individuals, when they're achieving something and they've done something positive, and then their boss or their manager goes, oh, "You could have, you could have done this a little bit better." It's important to find the balance. Like you've, yeah. you, what I'm saying is, there should be enough. If if that thing is so obviously good, yeah, then they don't need more. Like you, you should be able to get your arm around and go, Look, that was great. That was like, you've done an amazing job, mm. but we could, what, what can we do next? What yeah. can we do? But, but there's also a time where, and I think football gets it really right, where is, there is a time for celebration, mm. but there's also a time for respect. Yeah. Um, and yeah, look, look, it's, it's fascinating. The, the parallels are really interesting. Um, and yeah, like I said, it's the, it's the most fulfilling and, thing that I've ever done that I love and I genuinely feel like we're providing value for something that would never have had it if we weren't there. 
I love that, mate. I love that. The, the final thing I want to ask you, and I, I ask everybody this, but what's been your biggest lesson in business that you can give to the next, you know, 16 year old in his bedroom trying to start a sports website? Like what's the best lesson that you've taken over your years of growing goat? I think it's going to nicely sort of full circle the podcast. Mm. Um, and that is in giving everybody time yeah. and understanding that that time for somebody could be incredibly valuable in the same way as when I was reaching out to journalists mm. and I wanted, all I wanted to do was shadow somebody mm. and see what it was like to be a journalist at a massive sports game. Yeah. And the guy from the Bournemouth Echo said no, but Henry Winter, the biggest, most highly paid sports journalist in the country who writes for the Times, said yes and took me to England Ireland. That, he did not need to do. No. But he understands mm. that that time for me, arguably, changed my life. Yeah. And it cost him nothing. Mm. It cost him a few minutes introducing me to a few people, you know, sitting down, answering a couple of questions. But you know, I was respectful. I didn't want to bother him that much. I just yeah. wanted to see it. Yeah. I wanted to see what it was all about. Um, and those little things stick with me because I know that I also represent the business every time I talk. Mm. And people will judge GOAT on what I say, what Aaron says and what Nick says to everybody, Yeah, right? They will never just think about it as, oh, Harry's a dick. They'll just think, oh, GOAT, yeah. like, the guys are just a bit like, they'll just tarnish everything. Yeah, And therefore, we, like, who knows who that person talks to or their mm. mates with or they're married to yeah. or... Who knows? Yeah. So our, our lesson has always been be the nice guys, be the guys that people hate because they're jealous, not because they actually hate them. Yeah. <laughs> when they go, why do you actually hate them? Yeah. They go, not, not actually I'm not actually sure, sure yeah. I hate them. Yeah. I think it's just because they're doing well. Yeah. yeah. And then that's, that's it. Like be that. the good, be the good guys because God knows where it will get you. And I always, I genuinely always think that good guys win. Always. It's not the comic. It is the comic books. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you'll have to go through harder times and it might take a bit longer because, you know, bad guys cut corners. But it'll be and, sustainable. But it'll be sustainable. Yeah. And you'll make, you'll build relationships that you just never would and, unless you actually give people time. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, some of the, some of my best mates, like come out of those little phone calls or mm. someone messaged you on LinkedIn. You know, I went for a phase where I'd reply to every single LinkedIn message I had with a voice note. Because I was like, why wouldn't I? Yeah, I, can't, I, I physically cannot do that anymore. <laughs> but there was a yeah. there was a period during the vlog where yeah. it was so important to me that everybody who interacted with me watched tomorrow, mm. because I knew that if they'd watched five, they'd watch fifty. Mm. If they watched one, they might watch two. Yeah, but they wouldn't watch five. Yeah, but if they watched five, they watch fifty. So I was like, okay, well, every single person messaged me, I'm going to voice note them back and say thanks. Yeah. Um, and that's that's another thing that Gary Vee gets very, 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 very right. Yeah. Um, his ability to talk to everybody, give everyone time yeah. is, is incredible. Yeah. And I feel like that in my small world has paid me back in, in, in droves as well. Mate, Harry, thanks so much. No, thank you very much. It's been great.